crying out to the church as a whole. And you'll find that in verse 5. Where it says there, remember from where you were fallen and repent and do the first works. <clears throat> the part that I want you to see is to do your first works. Obviously, the rebuke of the Holy Spirit there in verse 5 of chapter 2 is that we have fallen away from the first works that God wanted for his church to do. Remember, these messages in Revelation 2 and 3 are addressed to the church as a whole or to the churches as a whole, either whether they be church ages or church times or physical location of those churches, however you want to interpret. I believe that he is actually relating to every church age that has ever come. And then also, even in the days where we live today, some of the things that they did, I see happening today. Especially the Church of Way of the Sea. <clears throat> but the Spirit of God is speaking to the church of Ephesus. He tells them first that he's left their first love. Well, leaving your first love doesn't mean that you necessarily <clears throat> stopped believing in Jesus just simply means that you've lost your passion for Jesus. And you see that happening so much today is that so many things that is vying for your time and vying for your attention. And it's easy to get sidetracked from really loving Jesus the way that we first started out loving Jesus. Well, let's be honest. So then the, the Spirit of God says to remember from where you were fallen. In other words, they had a place where they started and they fell backwards in that area. <clears throat> and then he says to repent of that, which we need to do, and do the first works. The part that really caught my attention out of all of that more than anything was to do the first works. So <clears throat> what were the first works that the Lord really wanted the church to do? The first works that the church that he wanted them to do, Jesus had prepared them to do that while the disciples walked with Jesus during those uh, three years that he walked with them. And he prepared them to do the work that Jesus wanted them to do. Remember, the church was to pick up from the works that Jesus was doing while Jesus walked on the face of the earth for those 33 and half years, but while the disciples were with him, Jesus began to train up the disciples to continue doing the same work that Jesus did when he walked the face of the earth. And that was to release kingdom power, kingdom authority. Jesus, remember, said, remember, I am about doing my father's business. The business of the father is to do kingdom business. Kingdom business sets the captive free. Kingdom business opens blind eyes and opens deaf ears. Kingdom business causes the cripples to walk. Kingdom business causes the demoniac to be set free. Kingdom business brings people to the foot of the cross of Calvary where they're washed in the precious blood of the Lamb and they are set free. That's what kingdom business is. That's what the Father's business is. And Jesus began to teach the disciples to do kingdom business while he was walking with them on the face of the earth, even before the day of Pentecost. Remember there in John chapter 14, where Jesus speaks to the disciples and said, uh, I'm going to the Father, but I'm leaving you with a comforter. You know who he is. Not only do you know who he is because he's with you, but then at that day he shall be in you. And he made the statement to the disciples, and the works that I do, you shall do, and greater works, because I go to the Father. So Jesus was training them to do that. If you just back up to Luke chapter 9 and chapter 10, you'll discover that Jesus sent them out in power with the Holy Spirit. And he said, go to the city. He said to raise the dead, cast out demons, heal the sick, and declare unto them that the kingdom of God has come unto you. So he trained them to do that even before he was crucified, before he was resurrected, before the day of Pentecost. Jesus began to impart into them the task that they were to carry through and to do the works 
Remember, greater works shall you do, these that I do, and greater. So he was imparting into them already the instruction of what we were supposed to be like as the church of Jesus Christ. We are to be <clears throat> the example of who Jesus is, because remember the scripture says in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17, it says this, as he is, so are you in this world. So you look at how Jesus is, he's triumphant, resurrected, he holds all authority and all power, and as he is, he's imparted that unto us. Hello? That's what we are supposed to be like in the earth today. <clears throat> Mark chapter 16, I believe, is a, is a great example. You want to just look there, and you'll see <clears throat> what those works were that Jesus declared unto us that we were supposed to do. <clears throat> I like this portion of the Great Commission better than just the way Matthew says it. Matthew says it just fine. I just prefer Mark chapter 16. It's the same thing that Jesus said <clears throat> in Matthew 28 when he said, Go into all the world preach the gospel, teaching them to become disciples and observe whatever I have shown them to do, for lo, I am with you even unto the uttermost ends of the earth. That's fantastic. That's wonderful. Because Jesus at that point says, all authority belongs to me. I am part unto you. It, it's given unto you. But I just like Mark 16 because it kind of draws it out a little bit more. In verse 15, he said unto them, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. How many believers do we have in here this morning? Amen. Hallelujah. You've got a promise to you right now. doesn't say these signs shall just follow the pastor, the evangelist, the prophet, the apostle, the teacher. doesn't say that, does it? It says these signs shall follow them that what? Are you a believer this morning? So then should signs be following you? Yes. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay? Because he's empowered you. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received unto heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming, confirming what? The word with signs and wonders following. Notice there that God will confirm his word with evidence that his word is true. His word. Not a denominational doctrine. Hello. Not religious jargon. But he will confirm his word. If, he, if you have your word in you, God will confirm his word. He watches over his word to perform it. The Lord says, have I not spoken it? Shall I not also perform it, saith the Lord? The Lord is not a man that he should lie. Nor the son of man that he should repent. If God spoke it, it'll come to pass. Yes. That's what the word of God says. You can what if and but and all of that you want to about it, but that won't change the authority of the word. All it will do is change the effect of what you said. Hello? Okay? So, what we need to do, the first works of the church, we need to get back to doing what the works of the church is. And that is to walk in kingdom power and kingdom authority, declaring the works of God. Okay? The works of God are healing. The works of God are deliverance. The works of God are miracles. The works of God are the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The works of God declare God's perfect will. Hello? Amen? Okay? So, <clears throat> I believe that one of the weak areas that we have allowed and the Lord just keeps on just bringing me back to this, is in that area of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And allowing people to move in power and authority that God has called us to walk into. And when we find, if you go to Acts chapter 2, because we're going to go there, we find that whenever God shows up, 
There is always a manifestation of his power, a manifestation of his glory. Okay? And God's presence is always marked by fire. Now, sometimes that's hard for us to grab a hold of, but fire always rep represented God's presence and acceptance of what was going on. Remember, even Jesus was introduced first by John the Baptist. I'm not talking about his birth when he was born, when the angel came and announced the birth of Jesus. But when Jesus was first announced of who he was by John the Baptist, John the Baptist made this statement. He said, the one who I'm going to baptize, I'm not worthy to buckle his sandals. But he, I, from not many days from now, he, I will baptize him with water, but not many days from now, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with, hello? Fire. Fire. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Fire was always the signification of the presence of God and the power of God. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay, with so many times and throughout the Word, you'll find that has uh, taken place. And the baptism of fire was always the hallmark of Jesus' ministry wherever he went. Okay, because it was always evidenced by his working. Okay, so it was always there. And so we know and we understand that the church was born in the fire. I mean, you understand that the church was not born the day that Jesus resurrected. The church was born on the day of Pentecost. That's the day that the church was birthed. Okay? And, and that day, remember... It was evidenced by fire. And I want to show you a couple of things that really declare the presence of God and how God walks in amongst us. And we need to come back to that so we can see the workings that we need to return to. We need to, we need to grab a hold of the truth of that. I remember years ago somebody made this statement about the church being born in the fire. It says that, and this was a statement they made. They said, we were born in the fire. But the smoke from its burning embers are burning my eyes. You stop and think about that just for a second. Embers represent a fire that's going out. It's not a fire that's continuing. So when they made that statement that we were born in the fire, but the smoke from those burning embers are burning my eyes, really touched my heart. I mean, that, that's been years ago when that, that statement was made. And they recognized that the church was losing its fire. We need to rekindle that. That's why Paul said to Timothy, he said, fan the flame. Rekindle the fire. So it's up to us that ask for God to blow on that, those embers. Cause it to blaze again. Cause it to be ignited within us. So that we can come back to doing the first works that he called us to do. Amen. Look at Acts Chapter 2. It says that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, everybody say suddenly. There came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it all and it filled the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them. Cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit hath given them utterance. Okay? So we find here in verse 3 that there was an evidence of the presence of God that came by what? Fire. You see that? Fire in so many different places, in times, different revivals. And the one that really just always sticks with me is 1946 in Indonesia, Meltari, in the Dutch Presbyterian Church. Now grab a hold of this. I mean, you know, God doesn't care about denomination. What he cares about is his church that is bought by the precious blood of his son Jesus. 
they were praying in a Dutch Presbyterian church and all of a sudden what happened is that the building looked like it caught on fire. And in Indonesia during that time, they didn't have fire departments. So whenever somebody saw a fire, noise went out throughout the whole city and they all grabbed buckets of water to come over and grab their buckets of water and then throw it on the building that was not being consumed by fire, but there was flames that were coming out of the top of the church. And they all came in there and they found out that the baptism of the Holy Spirit had just hit the Dutch Presbyterian Church in 1946 in Mar Indonesia. And God began to just move out all through Indonesia. And they were turning water into wine. They were walking on water. The dead were being raised. The blind were being, uh, being able to see. The deaf were being able to hear. The demons were being cast out of these individuals. I mean, there was an incredible, incredible outpouring of God that was first marked, just like the church in the book of Acts, that there was a mighty visitation of the Holy Spirit of God. Hallelujah. I'm looking for this building to catch on fire without being consumed. Glory to God. Amen? Okay? We need to expect God to meet us with his, that type of a presence. If he did it once, how many of you know it did again? Amen? Glory to God. Now, watch. Let's go back and let's find out the whole purpose. I mean, we, we talk about the excitement of Pentecost. We talk about the excitement of miracles and signs and wonders and those things. But what was the purpose of Pentecost? Pentecost just simply means 50. That's what the word Pentecost means. 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus, because we know that Jesus was crucified on Passover. 50 days after Passover came the Feast of Harvest. That's what Pentecost is. Fifty days after their deliverance from Egypt, they came to Mount Sinai. And I've got to show you this because this is absolutely incredible. How you see how God has a pattern and he sets that pattern in scripture so that you and I can understand why, when these things happen and how they're supposed to continue on. So the Feast of Harvest... And you'll see what took place after the day of Pentecost. How many people got saved on the day of Pentecost? 3,000. And then you see the church just grow exponentially all the way through. So the Feast of Harvest or Pentecost was meant to bring forth the harvest of souls into the kingdom of God. Okay? So here on the day of Pentecost... The Feast of Harvest, the purpose that God uh, was bringing forth was being fulfilled. Remember it says there that when the day of Pentecost was what? Fully come. In other words, there the prophetic type was being fulfilled in the church. What God intended those several thousand years ago at Mount Sinai was supposed to come to pass right then and there. And then was to be continually fulfilled through the church age. We need to have the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. Jesus said, don't do anything until you get and do with power from on high. Then you can become a witness unto me in Jerusalem, Jerusalem uh, Judea, and Samaria, and all the other most parts of the earth. So it was for the initiation of the harvest of souls, okay, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, <clears throat> watch what happens here in verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound, everybody say sound, sound, from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were all sitting. That word sound, hold your place there and go with me to Genesis chapter 3. I want you to see something, because remember we are dealing with the presence of God. I mean, if you understand that from Genesis to Revelation, God continues to confirm what he's always said and what he's always done. Always brings to pass the prophetic, always fulfills the, side, the types and shadows of what he did. Okay? Now, Genesis chapter 3, and you're going to say, how in the world does this relate to Pentecost? It relates a lot to the very presence of God and the fire of God. 
Because I want you to see something that God has set in motion. Look there in verse uh, 8. And they heard, Adam and Eve, heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. So we've established there by the very last bird, or the very last portion of that sentence, that the presence of God was there. Would you not agree with that? They hid from the presence of God. A lot of times we draw this picture of Adam and Eve in the garden, and they're naked, and it's the cool of the day, and, and they hear the voice of God. But if you look at the language that is used here, if you look back into the Hebrew, you'll understand something. Listen, I'm going to read it to you a little different. That NIV kind of gets it right. Okay? The NIV translates the word uh, voice as sound, which happens to be the exact Hebrew interpretation of the word uh, sound. And so it reads this way. It says, and they heard the sound of the Lord walking, watch this, in the wind in the garden. That's the literal translation. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the wind. Now you're going to grab this in just a second. Okay? They heard the sound of the Lord walk in the garden in the wind of the day. Go back to Acts chapter 2. And suddenly there came a what? A sound. Now that word wind in the cool, where it said in the cool of the day, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, is a rushing wind. It is a tornadic wind. It's the same that Job, in Job chapter 38, in verse 1, where it says, And the Lord came as a whirlwind unto Job. Tornadic type of a wind, like a hurricane. Acts chapter 2 came in as a, what does it say? A mighty, literally, a mighty violent wind. Now look how God shows up. God shows up and confirms his presence in the midst of them as a fire. He shows up for them as a tornadic wind in the midst of them, a hurricane, a sound, a loud sound that comes. And if you read Exodus chapter 19, and if you read it like in the message, it's an incredible description when God met with them on Sinai and he brought his presence. And I'm going to read that to you out of the message beginning in verse 16 out of chapter 19. And it says this. On the third day at daybreak, there were loud claps of thunder, flashes of lightning, a thick cloud covering the mountain, an ear-piercing trumpet blast, and everyone in the camp shuddered in fear. And Moses led the people out of the camp to meet God. They stood at attention at the base of the mountain, and Mount Sinai was all smoke because God had come down on it as Fire, smoke, smoke poured from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain shuddered in huge spasms. The trumpet blast grew louder and louder, and Moses spoke, and God answered in thunder. God descended to the peak of Mount Sinai, and God called Moses to the peak, and Moses climbed up. You notice how God met with Moses on the day of Pentecost at Mount Sinai. The same way that he met in, with his presence with Adam and Eve in the garden. He came to them with a... What? Mighty wind. A, a mighty wind. Glory to God. And with a loud sound. He came to them at Sinai with fire, a loud sound, and with a wind. He came to them on the day of Pentecost 
with a loud sound, with a mighty tempest of wind, and with fire, and a loud noise. Glory to God. Yeah. You got to grab a hold of this. <clears throat> Every one of them were met with the divine presence of God. This is why we've got to get past it just an experience of being baptized in the Holy Ghost. It is God Himself breathing His breath, His Spirit on the inside of you and filling you with Himself. Now it says there in verse 4, and they were all filled. Everybody say filled. filled. That word filled comes from the Greek word which is pleo. P-L-E-H-O. And it simply means this. It's like the wind that catches the sail of a ship. Now if you get this, you're going to be alright. He says when you feel, what happens when a wind catches the sail of a ship? It takes control of the ship. It puts it in the direction that it is supposed to go. It empowers it. It, equi it equips it. And it dominates that ship. When you and I are baptized with the Holy Spirit, it's more than just saying we're Pentecostal. Hello? That's just a term that man has created. I'm a born-again child of Almighty God, filled with the Holy Spirit of the living God. And I have come to the truth of what Pentecost is about. Now I need to participate with what Pentecost is about. What was the purpose of Pentecost? The people will say that it was for tongues. No. It was to empower you to bring the harvest. Because that's what Pentecost was all about. It was the feast of harvest. It's when they celebrated bringing in the harvest. There's only one way to bring in the harvest. Have the right equipment. How many of you understand you're never going to get that whole field of corn in with the John Deere lawnmower? <laughs> it won't work, will it? you got to have the right thing. I don't know what those things are called, but pick the corn and mow it down and all that kind of stuff. All of they just look fun to drive. But <laughs> I do know this, that you got to have it to get it done. And in order for us to bring in that end time harvest that God is bringing in and it's going to happen, and we're at the verge of that, is that we need to be empowered with the presence of God. My question is this, and it's a big question. And I don't know where the answer lies except for with God. My question is, where is the wind and the fire? That's my question. In God, I want the wind and I want the fire. Not to build up a big ministry or a big name because I could care less about that. What I do care about is somebody who needs Jesus. What I do care about is to see a crippled individual healed and set free. I want to see limbs grow out that have been detached for whatever uh, destructive force that hit that individual's life. Pete, I want to see God give you a brand new leg. I want to see you come in here one Sunday morning twirling that thing over the top of your head and dancing on two whole legs. Amen. I know God can do it. I've seen God put skin back where skin wasn't. It was burnt off by a fire. Nancy and I have seen twisted limbs turned around. We've seen people, bones healed right before. We've seen God do some of the most amazing healings and miracles. And you know what? Those days aren't over. Those days aren't over. We need the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit once again. 
And God wants to pour it out, but what he's looking for is vessels that he can pour it in. He's looking for nostrils that he can breathe his breath in again. He's looking for hands that will reach out that he can touch again. Where God is the wind and the fire. And I shouldn't be the only one asking that. All of us should be asking that question. The church of Jesus Christ should be asking that question. Where is the wind and the fire? We need to tear down our shingles of denominational barriers so that we can just say out there, we're the church of Jesus Christ. And stop arguing about whether God will heal or whether he won't heal, whether baptism of the Holy Spirit is there or not. We need not to ask those questions anymore. We just need to move forth in faith and trust God that he will use you in an incredible way. Because he wants to use you. He wants to empower you. He wants to equip you. He wants to cause that fire to be burning in you once again. We need to return back to the first works. So we need to ask ourselves a very important question in each and every one of us. God, what extinguished my fire? What was it that extinguished my fire? What is it that keeps my fire from blazing? What is it, God, that keeps me from not doing what I should be doing. If it's a lack of faith, I urge you to get in the Word. And if you can't find anywhere, which I know you can, where God has changed, then the problem isn't with God. <laughs> we need to make that change. Put our priorities in a different place. And look to Him for those answers. So I want to challenge you to do something this week. Introspect. The scripture says the spirit of the Lord is a candle of the Lord. Searching all the inward parts of the belly. That means your whole inside. Ask the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit... Illuminate. Search me. Show me what I need to change. Show me where I need to make more room for you. Show me where I need to get the fire burning again. And then remember what the Spirit of God said there in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 5. Repent. And to return you. That's the Holy Spirit. Show you. And then when he shows you, repent. Repent means two different things. It means several different things. One means stop doing what you were doing and turn around and go the other way. But it also means to return to the high place. High place. R-E. Re. Return. Pent means the high place. Return, get back to the high place, the place of God's calling that He has for your life as a born again child of Almighty God. Do that this week. Watch God make a difference in you. It's amazing. It is amazing. Father, I'm asking you right now. Father, just remove all cloudiness from all of our thinking and all of our hearing. In all of our doing. Just remove everything that would become an obstruction to hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. Cause, Father, not only your wind to come in and bring that power of the Holy Spirit, but cause your wind to come in and blow the dross from off of our life. Remove the dustiness. Remove all of the things that are keeping the fire from burning. Father, I'm just asking you just to hover over every individual that hears my voice. Hover over them and do an incredible work in their life. And raise them up to be a shining ensign 
of your love and of your glory and of your power and of your might, O oh God. Cause them to become brokers of the kingdom of God in a greater and a new way and bring in a harvest of souls to them. We thank you for that in the mighty name of Jesus. If you're in agreement with that, shout. Amen. 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 Ushers, if you'll come. Yes, Karen.